Now, uh, like I said, Sam's going to be coming up here to give our uh, keynote address for the day. Um, in his presentation, he's really going to explain why craft brewers should continually search for unique branding opportunities and think of their companies as organizations that can transcend liquid. Um, he's going to talk about the specific considerations for analyzing brand extension opportunities. Everyone who knows Dogfish knows that uh, they've got a whole line of uh, uh, soups and bratwursts and everything else. So he's going to talk about um, his initiatives beyond beer and uh, some of the ways that you guys can think about those opportunities for your own brands. Um, he'll, uh, you know, he'll, he'll talk about um, how he's been able to uh, transcend uh, beer for himself. And um, I, I think one of the ways, and this is a, a surprise for Sam here, um, one of the ways that he's actually been able to transcend beer is, uh, I don't know if you guys remember, he, he started a little uh, hip hop group. Uh, can, we, can we run the video? I won't embarrass Sam too much more. Sam, come on up. I, I don't know when you created that video, but uh, if this beer thing doesn't work out, you know, you might have a Grammy waiting for you somewhere. Here's the all the all important hey, I clicker. Know, I don't know really how to use that. But Forward and back, it. green and red. You got it. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to keep my day job, <laughs> not going back to that lifestyle. Although I do have to say, uh, uh, one of the, one of the ways that we uh, got to uh, innovate outside of liquid relatively early is Dogfish grew. We didn't buy any new brewing equipment. We opened in '95. We didn't buy anything new until like bought from a store, brand new specifically built for the brewing industry until our company was about seven years old. Uh, everything was either from home brewing or canning industry. We built a 30 barrel brew house out of a yogurt uh, factory's remnants. Uh, and we had the scrap yard that was near us. And when I'd go and deliver beer to two pallets in my pickup truck to DC or Baltimore, Philly, I'd take this road by the scrap yard and find used uh, dairy equipment, and whatever. And I found this crazy uh, filter thing that came from the pharmaceutical industry. And there was uh, a time in the, around 2000, uh, where uh, we were starting to sell some, some of our really hoppy beers outside the area. My buddies on the West Coast would, were giving us shit like, hey, you can't brew hoppy beers on the East Coast. What are you, ta what are you trying to do out there? And I rem kindly reminded them that Ballantines had been doing it since the 1950s in, uh, in uh, New Jersey, and they're like, all right, well, we got to get our, ourselves together. We'll meet you in, in some, some neutral ground. It wasn't that neutral. It was in D.C. And we'll do a bunch of uh, West Coast hoppy beers against uh, uh, East Coast. And it was Tom Nichols and Tommy Arthur, I think Adam Avery and Vinny. Who else was the fifth? Do you remember? Uh, I can't remember now. Do you, Tommy? No, on your team? I don't think so. But at any rate, uh, I was like, oh shit, they're going to bring the noise. I know they make some really nice hoppy beers. And I remembered that filter that I saw in that, in that scrapyard, and I brought it home and did a bunch of work to it and changed it up. And for a while, we used it kind of between our mash tun and our kettle to catch some hops and reconfigured it into the first Randall, and we brought it to that first uh, Lupul and Slam. Thought we'd only make one of those Randalls, uh, basically kind of real-time hopping device, and it, uh, you know, alcohol is a solvent, strips the oils and uh, fl flavors off of the hops and puts it right in your glass when you use it. Thought we'd make just one of those, and now we've made about 380 uh, Randalls, and we used a couple of them uh, last night on two very unique hop uh, uh, varieties that Hop Union brought to that event, uh, and that was an early way that we uh, got to use some tools outside of the liquid to bring more distinction to what we do um, as a brewery. Uh, so I'll start with a real, real 
short background on our brewery for those that don't know us. Uh, I opened Dogfish in 95. Uh, we were the smallest commercial brewery in the country in that era. Uh, that was before they had cool names for it, like Nano Brewery. It was most people just said before we were doing it was stupid. Uh, <laughs> but now it's Nano, so that's cool. Um, and, uh, and while it is relatively stupid from an efficiency and opportunity to be profitable perspective, it's still a great model for experimentation and getting into business. Perhaps a half barrel is too small. I was literally had a, had a mattress in my cellar and went home maybe two or three nights a, a week and otherwise brewed three batches every day uh, the first year we were open. So I'd recommend nanoing with a two barrel or four barrel system at, at the very least, but it's all we could afford. Uh, I graduated from college in 92. I was an English major. Like many of you, discovered Charlie's book and Michael's book, and I started working at this great beer bar in Manhattan where I was taking some uh, courses in writing uh, and got to try Celebration and Chimay Red in the same week. Had my epiphany, started home brewing by the second batch, told all my friends this is what I want to do for a living. Um, and uh, my first batch was great, my next two sucked, but I'd already told them I was going to do this, so I didn't want to go back on that. Uh, and it was, I think the internet existed, but was, I didn't know about it, so uh, I was doing my research, like Lexus and Nexus searches in, in the uh, New York City library, and mostly trying to figure out opportunities, knowing we were going to be tiny. I, I started Dogfish with $220,000, my dad was in for 25, my orthodontist for 35, the guy I built stone walls for as my summer job was in for 50, and with that 110, I was able to get a, a bank loan to match that with my dad putting his office up as collateral, so that was the 210 that started Dogfish. Um, and I, I, I knew we were gonna be tiny, and I knew that there was some awesome first-generation craft breweries that had done a great job trailblazing for so many of us. Widmere's, Pete, some of them are with us today, and uh, breweries like Sierra and, and, and uh, Sam Adams. And I knew I wasn't going to be able to sort of compete with what they'd established in their own brands and their own styles. So I, I looked for opportunities to create uh, niches. And as I did that study in the... In the, uh, in the um, library, I really saw an opportunity that, you know, looking at the inspiration of an Alice Waters, who was brought up earlier on the East Coast, someone like a James Beard, which were these American foodies that were saying, hey, let's not stop genuflecting towards Europe and their culinary traditions, and let's establish and celebrate what we already do so well here in America. And so I really saw an opportunity to create a brewery that was all about using the entire culinary landscape for potential ingredients instead of referencing uh, European brewing styles, which, you know, Sam Adams with an awesome German lager, Sierra Nevada with a pale ale. And in that era, 95, there really wasn't any breweries that were focused on culinary-inspired uh, beers, and we kind of made that our, our niche. So on to segueing into branding uh, and how we conveyed this message of what our unique uh, niche was going to be. Um, you know, basically, uh, our, our long version of our purpose statement is this Emerson quote, which I won't read to you, but in essence says, uh, don't just do what everybody else does, try and find something really, really unique, and if it's something really valuable and, and special, a small group of people will go on that journey uh, with you. But that, of course, doesn't fit on a six-pack, so the short version of our purpose statement is off-centered ales for off-centered people, which basically means the same thing. It's talking about what we'll do, what we'll make, but also who we're going to make it uh, for, recognizing that we were never going to be brewing for the majority of people because our beers would be so far outside of the, you know, the, the light lager, uh, terra, ter terra firma, and off on this flavor bridge in a, in a, in a direction that's pretty, pretty distinct from uh, the light lager uh, uh, juggernaut. Um, so as, as time evolved, we were able to, and, and I should say we, we were a company that focused on uh, um, transcending liquid, liquid from the day we opened. We intentionally, in my business plan, talked about we had to be a brew pub because we wanted to celebrate that commercial kitchen in a building being the, uh, the generator for both the foods and the beers to remind people that beer is just uh, liquid food. And so we knew from the get-go that food was really just as important for us uh, as, as beer. And our goal with the food was to be as rustic uh, and, and experimental uh, on the food side as we were on the beer side. So everything's wood grilled over hickory, oak, and apple logs. And since 95, it's mostly been wood grilled pizzas, seafood, uh, using beer infusions for ketchups and ice creams and, and things like that. But off-centered ales for off-centered people, the ales 
was first in that sentence, but we use that statement as a, uh, a compass to decide if there are directions we should go in that are tangential but related to beer that can be done authentically, meaning that the word ales in that statement is really dynamic. When we consider something new to get into, a new business, a new product, a new project, we just remove the ales from that sentence and use it, that, that sentence as a filter. So like off-centered spirits for off-centered people. Can we do that? Well, yeah, we're going to use this uh, unique honey and scraps from a surfboard company to age it on, a wood, wood scraps from a surfboard company, and we're going to use Cascade hops in our gin, uh, you know, which we've been doing for 11 years. So yes, we were able to find unique off-centered ways to do that. Uh, but we can also use it for uh, to, to help us prove out ways that aren't comfortable. Uh, for instance, a, uh, a hot sauce company, well-regarded, approached us and said, hey, we want to do hot sauces with you. And uh, so off-centered ales, or, uh, or, or off-centered hot sauces for off-centered people. And we're, we talked to them about it, and they're like, well, how will this be authentic? And they're like, well, we're going to use your image on the bottle. And I never put my face on a bottle. And they're like, and we're going to you know, talk about the beer. And I'm like, well, and you're, you're talking about using our different beers and the recipes. He's like, no, 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 we're just going to get some cheap generic beer keep costs down uh, but we're gonna make it really super hot and I'm like okay that one obviously didn't work uh, so we're not gonna pursue that so we get to use this as sort of shorthand for our first impressions on projects to see if they can fit within our, within our definition of off-centeredness before we pursue them um, so then this is probably of any slide I'll put up here for those of you just getting into the industry. The only thing I really care that you take away from, from, from what I'm talking about today. Three is the magic number, to uh, quote De La Soul. Uh, you know, there's, uh, we use this primarily for beer and secondarily for anything that we're considering doing. And when you think of it in the context of beer, you know, we should be recognizing that the big breweries are, are, are watching the success of the true indie breweries and are concerned. And I do think all beer is good, and I want to see the big breweries right the ship on the loss of market share against liquor and spirits. But I also know that they're remembering the late 90s, the last time we, when we saw as an industry supply really catching demand and what that did in terms of a shakeout. And the indicator in that era of the breweries that made it through were really, it was economic Darwinism and those that were making quality, consistent beer uh, and some of which was really well differentiated, are the ones that made it through. And there were nightline shows and the exposés where the big breweries kind of did a jiu-jitsu move and said, hey, they have momentum, but hey, some of them aren't making the most consistent quality beers in the world. Let's capitalize that and expose that and, and celebrate our strengths of having these giant, uh, you know, very efficient breweries with awesome QC, which they do. Um, and they kind of used that against us um, in that era. And I think now, even more than the late 90s, because the social media world and the community of beer enthusiasts is so much more robust and loud than it was in the late 90s, now this message is even more important because beer IQ of consumers is off the charts compared to the late 90s. And you know what you could get away with when I opened Dogfish, you can't get away with now. And all of our reputations collectively as indie craft brewers are relying on each of us recognizing that there's been this paradigm shift where the consumers want, expect uh, the highest quality and the highest consistency. And to look at each, each of the three of those, I think you can be a tiny nano brewery with a tasting room selling everything you make out of it and only focus on high quality to start with. Meaning if you're inconsistent, as long as your customers right there for you to be honest with them and say, hey, I ran out of Centennials on this batch of my IPA, I, I subbed in some Cascades, wanted to let you know. Uh, or if you're a brew pub and you still have that ability to talk to every consumer face to face. The moment when you have to at least do both high quality and consistent is the moment you start distributing outside of your single location or you open a second brew pub, meaning it's, it's the moment when you can't be face to face with every single one of your consumers and you owe it to them to be consistent in quality unless you're able to tell them the story on running out of Cascades and Centennials or whatever it was. Um, and I think you could be an awesome small distribution brewery or even a regional, uh, you know, a microbrewery uh, and only be super great at the first two things. But I think to be a national brand today in a world where, as Chris said, there's uh, 2,700 breweries and more than one opening every day compared to the era when I opened in 95 when there were 600 breweries and one opening every week, you really need that third piece, which is being well differentiated. 
And that's going to give you the legs to stand out in a crowded market where you don't just have that local vor story to tell. You can get away with a local vor in just the top two, but if you're going to try and expand beyond your local market, you really need all three. And we use uh, our, our portfolio of beers. Uh, it's been all about being differentiated from what's out there. As I told you, how we started as a, a brewery, you know, focused on culinary inspired ingredients. But we also use well differentiated brewery. We get to that through many of these projects that we do where we transcend liquid. So at an event like we did last night, not only were we were talking about how we uh, get to work with our pals at Hop Union and get the access to these awesome experimental hops and use them in a Randall, a physical thing that's not liquid that we use for branding. Uh, but tonight over at Tom Nichols' place, we're bringing out a bunch of our beer-infused brats and pickles, and, and we'll be able to sh uh, bring those to that event, which are unique things that when people come to this event, instead of it just being another beer event, they're like, yeah, I went to that beer event and it had this Randall thing, that was crazy, this one hop I like better than the other. Or I went to this beer event and, wow, I got to try this, uh, uh, this bratwurst and, infused with raison d'etre. They're storytelling components, but they have to start from the purity and authenticity of the product them, themselves. So that in the same way that in beer, you need to focus first on the liquid inside the bottle, primarily, uh, which is the quality and consistent before you focus on the storytelling that happens outside of the bottle. Um, the same thing follows through with every single project or product outside of beer uh, that you uh, consider uh, engaging on. Um, so again, back to our, our story, you know, w w it was so cool being in that room last night and seeing that history of beer uh, exhibit, very existential moment for me as a brewer, and I, for those of you in the room, probably was for you as well, and I had probably had my biggest sort of existential moment as a brewer when I was in uh, Egypt, uh, brewing a, working on a, a tahanket, which is an ancient Egyptian beer, and I got to go in this room called the Tomb of Tay, and it had the oldest artistic representation of the brewing trade ever, you know, found in, in, in the history of civilization. And what was so cool about it is back then, thousands of year, years ago, the same hieroglyph represented both bread and beer. It was interchangeable. And there's a, uh, you know, a very sane school of uh, science and thought that you know, beer is responsible for civilization as we know it because before the era of beer, Jiahu, China, the earliest beer 10,000 years ago, coincides exactly when humans shifted from hunting and gathering nomads to settling down to villages to raise crops. Uh, and I think we should all be proud of, of an industry that, that has that age. So again, that, that syn beer being synonymous with food uh, is critical to dogfish and how we transcend the liquid. So a lot of the projects that I'll talk about today or that you might see that we do are, are food related because A, we started from this place of wanting to be the first culinary ingredient inspired brewery and B, we wanted to serve our beers in the context of food because we tend to brew beers that are more wine-like, wine complex, ageable, uh, much, like, much like wine and, and, and show best in the presence of, of food. So you can see, you know, right from day one, there's me literally strapped to my bitch and Sabco in, in the mid-90s, mid um, but right at, right at the door of our original location, you know, Home, wood grilled food and homemade beer were the two neons in the wall in, in the in the window and they're still there today and sort of equally important to the identity of our company certainly now you know if if I didn't have that brew pub in 95 I opened that in 97 we opened our production brewery with that shitty Dan and yogurt equipment every we had this 1969 uh like East German soda bottle filler that was our first true bottling line and the thing was definitely built by like our enemies in the Cold War because it was sent here to rocket bottles at your head <laughs> and there was I paid a guy for a year to do nothing but push down valve number seven as it would come around in the bottling line and you'd always could tell the, the guys that worked on the bottling line because they were the guys like in ski goggles that were super jittery because they never knew <laughs> they never knew when a bottle was going to be hucked at their head so it's amazing that we made it through that era and we would have gone broke uh, if I didn't have this brew pub because I'm out there in 97 opening the production breweries trying to sell you know six packs of Immort Ale, peat smoked, 11% alcohol, wood aged, maple syrup beer uh, 97 for 12, 13 bucks a six pack and nobody gave a shit you know no one was going to buy that stuff back then so I had to take all the profits from my restaurant brewery just to keep my production brewery alive we lost money for three years and would have gone bankrupt if it wasn't for that brew pub so you can see why food's so important to, to my company for, for 
for a lot of reasons. Uh, and I remind all my coworkers that, there's about 180 of us now, that now that the, bro- the food side of our operation accounts for less than 10% of our over re- overall revenue, that's still the, the soul of our, our company, the food beer uh, origins. It's the heart of our company is probably the, the brewery pumping out uh, the lifeblood of, of revenue and profits uh, to all the other uh, external appendages that we're into now aside from uh, beer. And I'll also say as you're contemplating as a, as a smaller brewer getting outside of beer and doing some things that you think are going to complement your, your brand and, and your company, where, where that mostly starts to do it successfully, and, and I'd say we, we, we haven't done much uh, successfully uh, 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 but we learn pretty quickly from our mistakes and we're pretty fearless to make mistakes if, we're, if they're made in the name of authenticity and something that hasn't been done before. Um, so the, that big three at the beginning, when Dogfish opened, I would give us about a, a, a B in quality because we did source the best ingredients from the world. Sometimes my recipes weren't great, uh, but I'd give us a, a D in consistency, D minus probably. Back then I, I subscribed to the snowflake philosophy of brewing. Every single one of them's different. That's what's beautiful. Uh, that's not that's not cool, uh, uh, and then uh, but I would give us even back then an A minus in well differentiated. We always tried to do things that didn't exist in the beer world and create romantic, interesting stories around them authentic, interesting stories that would captivate beer, beer lovers. Now I'd say we're probably, you know, B, B, B plus at, at consistency, uh, A minus at quality, and still like A minus at, at well differentiated. I think we can always uh, keep, keep in, uh, improving. But really what it starts with when you're going to start, once you've dialed in first and firm, foremost quality, consistency, and differentiation on your beer, and you're ready to bring those attributes into projects outside of that, your ability as a leader of your company to be able to transfer your attention to that stuff really comes down to how well you can slough off the hats uh, that you wear. Because every startup company, every entrepreneur, you wear a lot of hats when you open your companies. Uh, you know, these guys were in there cooking him and his wife. I remember the first, uh, the first uh, event I did there and they, and they were bartending and they were cleaning the lines and we were hooking up kegs and they, and they still do. But as a company, as a company grows, you, you figure out which hats fit you well and you quickly try and identify people with with skills that complement your skills to put the ill-fitting hats on them. So I sucked at Excel spreadsheets and HR and, uh, and insurance uh, and uh, sourcing ingredients uh, I wasn't great at. So, you know, I found a guy like Nick Benz, who our COO, he's a sick financial mind, does that so well. Uh, my wife, Mariah, I'm sort of the analog uh, representation of the Dogfish brand, and I get to go out and do a lot of events. Mariah's awesome at being the, the digital uh, identity of our company and answers every Twitter and Facebook thing her, her, herself. And Megan, who was here last night and set up the event for Dogfish, what she does in the San Diego market, you know, means that I don't have that hat on where I have to come to to, to, to the West Coast as much. And so really, I've been really lucky to find these people whose skills complement my own so I can take these hats off and focus on what I'm pretty good at, which is what are we going to do next? What projects complement our brand, whether it's a new beer that's coming out, a complementary uh, industry product project outside of what we're doing in Delaware in the brewery. And doing the math, I think I spend about 25% on day-to-day operations. Uh, I spend about 25% of my thinking time and working time on future beer stuff, whether it's events or a new beer that's coming out. Uh, And then 25% right now on my work at the Brewers Association and uh, trade group work and and stuff that's not just dogfish specific. And that other 25% of my time is really focused on projects outside of beer, but that are dogfish products. So I don't want to give the impression that these side projects are just fun things to to work on and don't take a lot of time. They take an incredible amount of time. We have a full-time lawyer at our company. I never thought I'd say that sentence. Uh, And I'd say 30 or 40% of her time is contracts with musicians, contracts with food companies, uh, contracts on licensing and uh, clothing companies that we're working with, not even the, 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 the meat and potatoes of our distributor context contracts and and that work. Our marketing team has a lot of work that they have to do to support these projects outside of beer. So go into them only once you've got quality consistency and well differentiated dialed in for your beer and go into them only once you've been able to remove some of those ill-fitting hats that every entrepreneur has to wear when they start out because it takes a lot of time to, to, to do this stuff. 
Um, so, you know, we, we tried to, tra- uh, what's the talk, what's this title of the talk again? Transcending the liquid. We tried to, initially, transcending the liquid for us meant beer. It meant transcending uh, traditional beer styles. And just a snapshot of pulling some bo- bottles forward and the way we try to do that and tell stories. We don't, all, you know, much beat our, our, our chest about, you know, the era of when things come out, but it's kind of, Interesting now with 18 years history, the arrows that we took for, oh, what the hell did you put in your beer this time now, Sam? Salad. Uh, the stuff that people would tell me at beer festivals in the mid-90s uh, and, and uh, was, was harsh but fair. Um, but, you know, when you look at kind of what we've done as a portfolio, in 95 we came out with Immort and Chicory Stout, which is kind of like the first breakfast beer made with chicory and coffee and the, a wood age beer, 95 and Immort. 97, we came out with India Brown Ale, which I think was probably the first darker black IPA. Raison d'Etre is the first sort of beer wine hybrid, 97. Uh, 99, we came out with Midas Touch as the first sort of ancient ale branded as, as an ancient ale. Uh, 99, you see Raison Dextra, or no, that'd be 98, Raison Dextra uh, was the first music series we, beer we did with uh, Mekon's lead singer, John Langford. Uh, Worldwide Stout was the strongest beer in the world for a short time uh, before Sam Adams took that back. That was 99. Uh, 90 Minute IPA, Greg Cook recently told me when he was researching that that's actually the first bottled Imperial IPA. I think his he, his arrogant bastard came out soon after 90 minute and Festino Lente, which is one of the first American wild ales we brewed over a decade ago, or when we sent it out and all the distributors were like, this beer sucks, it's sour, and they sent it all back to us. And <laughs> the next year it won a, a, a World Beer Cup medal up against Cantillon and stuff, and by then we're like, fuck you, we're going to drink it ourselves. <laughs> and we never sent it back out. Uh, but that one led to us doing uh, Festina Pesh, which was the first American bottled Berliner Weiss a couple years after that. So we really, really tried try, whether it's an, a, a project outside of beer or inside of beer, to not look to the left or right of us and try and figure out something that we can f- create a niche and as that niche grows and it's awesome that all, co- all kind of companies put their own thumbprint around or on that niche, it, we can always be kind of recognized uh, for our position in the, in the areas that we decided to, to focus on. But you do take a lot of arrows because when you're coming out with a, a tart Berliner Weiss as your summer seasonal in 2000 and whatever, Seven, you know, you get a lot of uh, distributors looking at you like, I don't think this is going to sell. Um, so sticking to your guns and making sure you're only choosing projects that you're more passionate about because you love the product instead of thinking that you need it for money is going to be critical because there are going to be projects that, that are not well received commercially and unless you believe in them, you're going to give up on them if it's just about money. Um, and then so just using one as an example, um, Namaste uh, is a beer that we'll, we're bringing up it's, we've done it for six or seven years in 750 mil bottles. We're bringing it to market as a core beer now, but uh, the differentiate, differentiating story, origin story of it, liquid number one, how is it differentiated? Yes, it's generally in a Belgian white style, but we buy in, from the culinary side, uh, sort of transcending the, the liquid. Uh, lemongrass, by heating and freezing the lemongrass uh, repetitively, we break down and explode the cell walls and it explo- ex- explodes more aromatics from the lemongrass. It's sort of Shandy-esque in that it, it, traditionally a Belgian white just brings the, the citrus peel into the recipe. We buy whole dr- dried cuts of uh, orange that still has the orange flesh in it. So the yeast is eating not just the wheat and barley sugars, but the juice, uh, orange juice sugars as well. The story came, I was having lunch with my wife and kids, asked them each to come up with a beer name and what they'd put in it. And Mariah, my wife, had just done yoga and said namaste uh, and lemongrass. And then months after, our buddies at Tre Fontaine in, in Belgium had a horrific accident. Their heating system, cooling system died, and it fried all the beers in fermentation and they had tens of thousands of dollars in losses. And my buddy uh, Leo, a brewer from Biro del Borgo in Italy, was visiting me. And I was like, hey, let's brew a batch uh, of beer and give the profits to, to, to the guys at Trey Fontaine Armand. And so it was our way of saying namaste, like, which means the spirit in me celebrates the spirit in you, to back to the Belgian brewing culture that gives us and a lot of brewers in this room a lot of inspiration. So the, the story of namaste can be told in a way that's not just differentiating the liquid itself, why it's different from other Belgian white beers that are out there and the ingredient makeup, but also the history of how it came to be, the meaning and distinction of, of the name as well. All of that's important, whether you're making a, a, a beer, a, a shirt, or, or a package of, of hot sauce. Um, and I'll also say here, that it is important to, 
you know, there's only half a million words in the English language, and with over one brewery opening every day, it's inevitable that a new brewery is going to accidentally uh, think of using a name that another brewery is already uh, using. And I just say, you know, our industry was found on altruism and 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 respect from the day that. You know, Ken Grossman knocked on Fritz's door and said, hey, you done using that little filter over there? Do you mind if I buy it from you? And handing over of that first thing was the way this industry started and that spirit of brotherhood. So it's inevitable that there's going to be times that breweries uh, accidentally step on another brewery's brand. All, I just think we owe it to each other to be really respectful and acknowledge when that happens uh, for us to stay as altruistic and, and mutually supportive uh, as we can. Uh, so moving into some of the more specific uh, projects, uh, um, that looks like an ad for uh, gay marriage, I just saw. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, uh, that's, we, we, I think we were the first brewery to do a, 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 a clothing collaboration. We worked with a company in Maine uh, called uh, Rogue's Gallery about eight, nine years ago. Um, and we designed a whole line of clothes that were meant, meant to be wor worn at like a beach uh, you know, Twilight uh, barbecue beer, you know, keg party. Um, and we did a beer with them where we designed the beer and the recipe, but they designed the label, which was our squall ale. Um, we've got, we currently do our food, uh, a, a clothing collaboration with a company out of Los Angeles called Apollos Global. I got a, a hat here. Again, quality, consistency, well differentiated, you know, the product itself is made with wool, it's got a felt for, for the fish on the front, a, a leather back, it's made in America. We don't sell them, they're for VIP friends of our brewery only. If some brewer came from Brazil, as they did to our brewery last week, I give them, give them this hat and they can go home and say, hey, this is something Dogfish doesn't even sell, it's something that, that special. This one's for Chris for inviting me. Um, and we, we got another uh, uh, clothing collaboration that we'll be uh, working on uh, next year. But again, through that filter of authenticity, why Apollos? Well, they have a, a, a mission, and, and their mission is uh, advocacy through industry, and we believe people can live better lives when they are given equal access to the global industry. And when Dogfish, the way we source our ingredients globally, the way we go around the world to try and resurrect these ancient beer styles and celebrate these cultures for being adventurous brewers thousands of years ago in whatever corner of the world they brewed in, that's why this company and their mission uh, f gelled with ours and why we felt that this collaboration outside of beer was authentic and worth uh, pursuing. And then uh, uh, next would be our spirits. We were the second brewery in America to open a distillery behind our friends at Anchor. So we've been distilling for well over a decade. Uh, I talked a little bit when I talked about our, using the ales and off-centered ales as, as a filter and a placeholder, how we do this with spirits, with our Cascade hop-infused gin, our, our, our rum. And we believe in the spirits industry uh, and we'll continue to expand our, our, our spirits uh, business um, and keep doing recipes that don't look like what else is, is out there. Um, more recently, like I said, from day one, we were a food and beer company, uh, but we've been doing uh, projects outside of the liquid in the food world for, for many years. Uh, probably the first one outside of our own doors was our relationship with the Alehouse Group, Dogfish Alehouse Group. We have three Dogfish Alehouses in the D.C. market. It was truly a leap of faith uh, where we're licensing our trade dress, our menu, our recipes, our logos to these really good restaurateurs who happened to have a summer home right near our brewery. So they fell in love with Dogfish. They were doing some other restaurant concepts and said, hey, we want to take this, um, this here. And in that era, all of our cash flow was going towards expanding our production brewery. So we thought, yes, it's a leap, leap of faith, but we trust these guys. I and mean, it can give our brand a very local presence in our closest metro market, uh, bricks and mortar presence in, in our closest metro market if we take this risk and do these projects with these guys. And they've done a great job. Our, our brew pub learns from them, frankly, on operations and consistency of food. Uh, we, they're very, very good. And uh, that, that relationship works well. Another one we do is with, that's, that's certainly a, a more local uh, transcending beer collaboration that we do with the Ale Houses in, in the Mid-Atlantic. A more global one that we do is working with Mario Batali and Joe Bastianich and the Frenetti family on the Italy Birreria projects. Uh, we, uh, we program the breweries at the Birreria Italy stores. Uh, we help design the equipment, we train the brewers, and we come up with the recipes. By we, I mean Dogfish, uh, Baladan Brewery, and Bira del Borgo, breweries in turn in Rome, Italy, respectively. The three of us are the Birreria Brother Breweries. We have a a, a 
a three and a half barrel brew house on a rooftop in New York City at that beer area. Mario and Joe do the food side of that. Same thing with the one in Chicago. We just opened last week, and we have breweries in Rome and Bari, Italy as well. And when you go to these breweries, you've got the big dogfish logo next to the other two, and it gives us a local presence in cities as far away as Chicago and Rome. We get to do the recipes for them, and the press that comes out of that regionally, again, gives our brand this sort of global scale, even though the brewing capacity is relatively insignificant compared to the brand impact that it brings along with it. Uh, uh, also recently, uh, we announced that we, we bought a, a hotel right down the road from my house in, in the town of Lewis, which is kind of equidistant from our production brewery in Milton, Delaware, and our brew pub uh, in, in Rehoboth. And we have programmed a hotel room in an inn the other road, way down from my house. For eight years, we've been doing a project called uh, Brewmaster's Suite, uh, where it comes as a weekend package. You get your own VIP tour of the brewery. I have a little piece of shit Boston Whaler. I take the guests by boat to my pub through the water so they see how beautiful our area is. They get a gift certificate there, get a taxi home so they don't have to drive. It comes with a, a kayak trip to see dolphins. And really, the idea is we know we live in a relatively out-of-the-way part of the world in the context of you know, you know, globally recognized beer cities like Milwaukee or Munich. You know, Milton's not right there on, the, on your tongue. But what's really nice is we get 3,000 visitors to our brewery every week on average, 1,000 of which come from out of state, and as we surveyed them, half of those that come from out of state came out to, to Delaware to see dogfish. So you know they're not coming uh, just for a day trip. And so we know how much we, we um, bring back to our local economy, and we thought maybe we can make their, their experience even more inclusive, because for us, the dogfish brand, as we've said, is not just about ales. It's also about, not, and not just the products and projects we do, but celebrating how beautiful and under-recognized coastal Delaware is. I get tired of seeing the two Portlands in every you know, issue of Outside or Men's Journal magazine is coolest places to live. I love those places, but we live in a really beautiful place that's two, and a half, two hours from D.C., Baltimore, Philly, three and a half from Manhattan. So by taking over this inn, we can get people that are touring to have a more inclusive dogfish experience. They can kayak or paddleboard to either of our locations, bike to either of our locations, uh, and see how beautiful uh, coastal Delaware is. We'll use it for beer enthusiasts through the summer, as we have with our package for eight years, but in the off-season and the shoulder seasons, where rent's not quite as high, we'll use it to bring our retailers and distributors to coastal Delaware as reward programs through distribution uh, to get them more familiar with the brand of Dogfish at its source and meet the awesome people I work with that are really the ones that make Dogfish great day in, day out. And in the cold heart of winter, we'll be timing our CapEx projects so that the Germans in blue jumpsuits that come to build our equipment and we pay to live in hotels for many months, now we don't have to pay for external hotels. We'll use the winter months uh, for our CapEx projects and house the, the people doing the work uh, in, our, in our hotel. Um, so I'm, I think, how am I doing time-wise? I'm a little over. All right, so with that, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not going to end with anything other than, uh, I guess, uh, you know, the, I got to work with uh, Miles Davis and his family on a beer called, well, not him, he's dead, but I, his nephew and his family, I got to sit in the Electric Landlady studio where they mastered that album and listened to the masters with his network. And, uh, and uh, I, his, ne his nephew told me something that really resonated with me, and when you're thinking of these projects outside of the liquid, I hope it does with you as well, when asked what made his sound so unique and how he became such a creative force in jazz, he said, don't play what's there, play what's not there. And that's really what I urge every one of you to do, whether, whether it's with your beer or these kinds of projects outside of beer, look for opportunities, look for niches that you can scratch that have not existed before, and if you do them well, uh, people will join you on, on your journey. So best of luck with your own uh, brewing pursuits. Cheers.